Um, I'm right. going to post. Okay, <laughs> let me post the URL on HipChat. Oops. Uh, that's the URL, uh, August 22nd. Um, that's the live URL. And uh, let's uh, post this. All right. Um, so I should say I would say we should get going. I think the main um, the main items are the big ones are Zach's uh, work on multi-directory and Thomas's work on um, two to three. Um, so I don't know in in either order. Whoever's ready to talk, Zach, if you want to go ahead, or Thomas, if you want to go ahead, it doesn't matter. Um, I'll jump in. Sure. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so the multi-deer stuff, Paul's been working a lot with me on that and helping me kind of uh, review it and write tests for it. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think, just code review that's going to need to happen now because I, for the most part, it's working. I'm writing, uh, Brian helped me write tests that launch a server and let me actually test the APIs themselves. Um, I have tests for all the managers um, done. And yeah, so it just needs people to take a look at it and and uh, hopefully get it reviewed in and in soon. Uh, I think Brian said after I'm gonna finish writing all the API tests today. Uh, okay. That will actually they'll actually test the handlers themselves explicitly, uh, and then after that, uh, I think we talked about tomorrow, uh, or um, either later today or tomorrow he would sit down with, uh, next to me and we'd actually go through code review on the multi deer stuff explicitly and uh, and clean that up as much as possible and then we can get that merged. Um, okay, yeah. So so one one thing that I that I want to make sure though is that others have a chance to review it as well, not not just the two of you guys. Right. So I, I, I would want to make sure that because one thing that and we, we have time uh, before before the release of this, and one thing that I think happened, and uh, I know that Min and Paul um, and others mentioned this, was that with with the time pressure we had on the NB convert stuff, the actual code didn't really get as much review as it should have. Um, and uh, I mean, the functionality is good. We have we have, and it was a huge amount of work, so we were a little bit. Uh, with our backs against the wall time-wise, but we're not back, I, I, and I realize that Zach's schedule is, is a little different and is leading, but as a project, we're not back against the deadline of having to release in two weeks, right? And so I, I want to make sure that the code has a chance to get a, a proper <coughs> a proper thorough review in um, in, in before before we merge it. So I, I the, what seems like a good plan to me would be to have um, you guys kind of Put it in a state where you think you're happy with it, uh, because you're the two. Brian and you are, are the two who have had the most the most work hands on with the code. Uh, and then as soon as as soon as you think so, then you just give you basically give us the go ahead. And if that's tomorrow, that's perfect. And then we will all dive into it. Um, yeah. It's a good time to be doing the review of that. Um, with Min being gone, um, we're not going to be. Um, doing a lot of other uh, merges as well. That a, a lot of a lot of the other stuff is kind of under under his control. So I think the the rest of us can try to review that code carefully and thoroughly, so that when we merge it, we're comfortable with the merge, right? I, I don't want to have to do post -mer a lot of post merge cleanup and review. So uh, Thomas and Paul have been reviewing it for about the last I don't know week and a half. Okay. Um, although I don't know, I mean. Thomas and Paul, what do you think there's more review you guys want to do? Yeah, so I got I at least got some way into it and you know, I I left some comments, I made some changes which I submitted as a pull request to Zach, um, and then I kind of dropped it and went and did other things. Okay. So yeah, I should definitely go back and have a closer look at it. Great. Yeah, yeah especially and, and all the, the string Unicode Python three type stuff. That that's where. Yeah, I didn't really get to looking at that when I reviewed it before. Okay. 
and and I haven't I haven't finished. I've, I've been sort of going function by function with Zach, so I send him feedback as I as I get it. And so yeah, I'm not I'm still sort of I haven't looked at the whole thing overall. Okay. That's so, uh, awesome. Also, also uh, just kind of an idea on my time constraints because it's actually so I, I'm actually working here in San Luis Obispo uh, until next week, probably midweek, Wednesday or Thursday, and then. Mm-hmm. I don't actually start uh, school until the last week in September. So I, I will still be working, even though I won't be in San Luis Obispo, I'll still be working. Okay. Uh, but I'll be up in Oregon. Good um, to know. Okay. So, so I, there's not as much time constraints. It's not like we have to get this out like with me around for a week. I'll be around at least for another month. And then, you know, it's, you know, it's a grad school, so I'll have plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> spoken like a time. spoken like a true believer. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, okay. Well, that, that that that's better because I thought the constraint was much harder. I thought next week you were leaving and you were sort of just gone, gone, gone. Um, but but if you have some bandwidth, I think it's perfect then because it means basically as soon as tomorrow you guys give us the the get uh, the the, go, the green light, we will begin uh, uh, all reviewing this and then you can address whatever feedback comes back you know, over the next week or we can have whatever it takes um, and then we then we merge this thing. I mean uh, from. Brian's comments, uh, it looks uh, really good. I'm going to start test. I haven't actually tested it. So I, the last time I saw it was at the dev meeting. So I'll, I'll merge it today for to start playing with it. Um, and and I'll, start, I'll start reviewing as well. Uh, I submitted this big grant that I was working on two days ago. So I have a little bit more. Uh, yes, yes, it was. It really was. <laughs> it was a, a big load off my back. So, um, so I'll, I'll also start playing with it. Um, but I think this is going to be very, very exciting. Yeah. Um, you also, uh, is there anything else on, on 3619, Zach, that you wanted to discuss, or Brian, that you wanted to uh, pitch in with? No. Um, so, I, I mean, I'll just mention Zach has in a separate branch uh, a UI for the multi directory stuff. I don't think it's ready for review yet, um, but it's looking really good. I, I think it, it's going to be just fantastic and uh, great. It, it's. I, I think it's important because it tests the current PR in a way mm-hmm. that to see like can we develop a UI easily on top of this? And the answer is absolutely yes. It, it's it's going to be really nice. Awesome. Yeah. That, that, uh, that's really good to hear. The comment on that. I actually haven't pushed that to uh, GitHub, so I'm gonna I'll do that in. Oh yeah. Why don't you just push it to your even if you don't open a PR, or you can always you could even open it as a PR and you simply mark in the title. Just to, so that it's really explicit, just put in the title of the PR in brackets, uh, work in progress. Um, and so we know that it's not for, not meant for merge. Um, right. So, but, but it's right mm-hmm. there. The, the, the thing is, it, it, it makes it visible right away for people to play with. Um, and since we have tools to automatically, like, automatically create exp- local merges of PRs for testing, it's just easier than if we have to fish it manually out of your uh, repo. Definitely. I just didn't want anyone, anyway, if they're looking for it right now, it's not on there right now. So I'll do it in okay. the next. 20 minutes or so. I'm taking notes on Hackbat on this. Okay. Um, any any other um, anything else on on the the kind of broader multi dir stuff? Anything that you guys encountered that was a, a problem either on the JavaScript side or on the architectural side? Anything that you're particularly unhappy with, um, or that you foresee as a problem? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Smooth ah, sailing. That's, that's, ah, yeah, fantastic. That, that's really sweet to hear. Okay. Um, Zach, you also had some notes since you sort of have the microphone now on your um, graphic, uh, the graphic designer friend. Yeah. Uh, I just wasn't sure uh, what... Uh, I, I, Brian and I talked a little bit about uh, her yesterday, just kind of like what it would look like with her. So she's... Mm-hmm. The, the nice thing is I think she fits our team well in the sense of she's... You know, it's it's a it's a uh, a side thing for her. It's more fun for her. Um, she's looking for. She's easy to work with. She's someone. You know, it's not this huge uh, uh, company that you're bringing in. It's just uh, mm-hmm. her and a couple of friends who are starting their own web development, uh, design development uh, business. And um, they they're when I told her about this, she viewed it more as an opportunity to to get. Um, to work with a project that's succeeding and doing well, and to has it as like a resume builder in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, she's very good at what she does, but um, 
and so she, she's kind of those people. Like we give her exactly what we want. We can be very detailed. We're uh, we're probably more OCD and and uh, uh, <laughs> you know we, we have our specifics that we want, and so we can be a lot more uh, controlling if we want to mm -hmm. with her. Uh, and at the same time, uh, she can shine in what she's good at. So. Yeah. Uh, and there's no there's no like time constraint for her. She said, "Just get back to her." I just thought I would give her an update on what we have been thinking or wanted to do with it. Um, I'm I'm very I am very very pro moving forward on this right now, unless anybody sees a reason not to. And the reasons that I see to for doing it are, um, we've had a we've had a release. We are kind of at a good point in our cycle. We also need to do some updates on the website, which we'll have to do even before she has a chance to join in. Um, but but if we can do it in conjunction with her, that might be even better, um, because we've had some sponsorships come in that I don't want to announce publicly yet, because we're preparing the, the information. But you guys have heard about it privately. Uh, and we want to thank sort of some of these new sponsors for the project. Uh, and so we want to set up a little page with, with some PR press releases and, and acknowledgments and a sponsorship page and whatnot. So it's, it's a good time for somebody to get started on updating our visual language. And, Thomas has done some of that work in the past, um, but I think it, it would be better if someone like Tom, and, I, and I've done some of that as well, but I think it would be better if instead of some people like Thomas and me who tend to be low level, we have somebody who actually knows about web stuff <laughs> working on that part with, with our input. So, and we have, we also, I mean, I, I, I think it's great if she wants to work with us as an open source project and build her resume, but if at some point uh, she needs to build some hours, we, we do have some, some of that allocated in the budget, and it's perfectly okay to to uh, pay her for her time when she does it as part of the business and not as part of sort of open source work. Uh, if it comes to that, we can do that as well. We budget it for that. Yeah. So I would I would say by all means go ahead. Um, I can't be here unfortunately uh, at the next week dev meeting. I, I have an all day workshop on campus that I must attend, um, so I won't be here. Um, but you guys could start conversations informally with her, um, and maybe we can invite her to a dev meeting later on, uh, or we can have a separate hangout with her that's not public if she if she won't if we want to talk privately a little bit first. Um, so I, I would say move forward, yeah. So I, I unless, think, any, un, unless anyone has sees it differently, I'd, I'd be happy to hear. I, I think what I, I was thinking um, is to put to talk talk with Zach a little bit, and come up with a few well boundaried mini projects that she could start out on. Sort of brainstorm on that, and, and we can bring that back to the to the dev meeting. And, and talk about those things, and then start out with a conversation, her, Zach, and I, and then you know, basically go from there, bring her in, and, and have all of us meet with her online. And, 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 and we, we can, I was thinking that there's kind of a couple of different directions. One is the uh, website direction. Right, yep. kind of the visual, the vi and the broader visual language of the website and logos and icons and things like that. The other one is the the, the view and layout and the visuals of the web application itself. Ab um, absolutely. I would I would start with the website because it's a little bit more sort of more traditional uh, material. The, the web application is this kind of funky hybrid between yes, it's a web browser, but it's more like a desktop app it's a little it's a little bit of a weirder animal whereas mm -hmm. the website is a website uh, and, and a logo is a logo these are things that any any person who works in, in visual design is, is accustomed to so I think it's a more sensible ramp on project and we need it mm -hmm. and, and we need it right? yep. and we know we want it so yep. so so I think that's that's the most sensible place to start and once we've built up some momentum with her and her team, um, and she's kind of used to our visual language and we've sort of agreed on that at the level of the website we can begin bringing her, her thinking and her um, expertise into the web application itself, where there's also JavaScript and CSS and graphical elements and whatnot. Does that yeah. sound reasonable to everyone? Yeah, I, I think that I mean, we might even want to start smaller scale, like not, rather than the entire website, I, I don't know, part, part of the website, or just a logo, or sure. you know, so basically start start small, see how it works, and. And build from I there. actually, I actually wouldn't start with a logo. I think the logo is one of the hardest things. I, no, I, Seriously, yeah. I, 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 think that something like, I don't know, clean, um, the layout of a couple of pages on the website and the sponsorship page and and suggestions for layout and whatnot, um, okay. and and the CSS is actually, the, it's the most natural thing. The the logo for a project like ours, which in a sense, um, struggles with finding a single a single narrow way of defining its scope. 
uh, is going to be hard in the sense that we've we've never even been able to come up with a good short design brief. And graphic designers are not magicians, as as we know. They can only uh, a good visual designer operates off a good design brief. Um, and for IPython, that design brief is itself a difficult thing to to put into. In, Go ahead. Do you want me to take a stab at a design brief for the website? And then, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, mean, I would say, and and I would say, yeah, put it. Um, an IPEP. Yeah, put it. Yeah, an or IPEP. Issue, or issue, or I mean, it doesn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, just in in some mechanism um, where we can um, we can ju just kind of dump feedback uh, and discuss it so that we can iterate, and then we can once once it's in rough enough shape. For feedback, we can we can give it to, to her to begin thinking about it Great. As, a, as a way of starting the conversation. Yeah, I think that's a perfect idea. OK. And actually, you can make it, the, since the website is a repo, um, I, that's where I would do it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, website, the website is a repo, right? Yep. So, um, and, then the later, and, and then later for the logo and things like that, marketing is a repo, right? There is a marketing repo that has those materials. Um, so we, we can just use those mechanisms, which are kind of the natural the natural mechanisms for that. Perfect. I'll do that. Okay. Good. Uh, let me uh, quickly. Um, why doesn't somebody else uh, take hand of the meeting for the next few minutes, and I'll type up what we just said here. I just I just want to go, go back to the uh, Zach's PR for a minute, and yeah. um, just yeah. I'm just wondering because um, I remember looking at it and talking to Zach about it last night <laughs> is. Um, a little bit of a concern about scope creep, or just what what exactly multi dir means when it's merged? Because some of the functionality that Zach has in there are things to like deleting files and uh, deleting directory trees and things like that. And so I just wanted to see it where where we stand on that. And look, oh, I can so the, I, I think what we we realized as we started to work on it was that to do the multi dir stuff correctly. It was a complete refactor and rewrite of the server side of the notebook. Mm -hmm. So I, I view this as literally an entire new notebook server, basically. I mean, it, literally, it, it, it's almost a. I mean, well, I guess the. Well, no, even the kernel service, everything has been completely rewritten. So, um, I think what Paul's concerned about, and I. I don't know. I, I, I guess I kind of, there's a couple things in there. So like uh, there's there's a web service that we're including that's a contents web service, which the idea was this was something we were going to, uh, when we start you know dealing with like other files other than notebooks, uh, I wrote that service with that purpose. Uh, yeah. And so that's how I, uh, you know, when we, when I, when I show you that UI the other day about uh, what a multi-directory service, webs or uh, I'm sorry, the multi-directory UI would look like, the contents web service is called so that you can get you know the multiple files showing and yeah. and you can navigate through your through your uh, directories file system. The problem is I include in there a a delete uh, a, a request to delete a content which allows you to delete a folder uh, and also post a folder. Uh, to your tree, and I, uh, I don't. Is that something we want to include in this PR, uh, like in the contents manager or web service? Should I be able to create and delete, or should I just leave it right now, just so it shows folders? I I would want to keep it sort of in, in in the interest of doing of landing things incrementally so that we can understand them. I would. I would try to, if it's possible. I mean, I understand that sometimes some amount of deeper refactoring is the only way to do something correctly. So that's that's okay. I'm, I'm not I'm not opposed to that. But I think once it begins to 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 being sort of building on this functionality, if if it's something that can be done in a separate PR later on, I think we should do it that way. I think we should we should try. I mean, the bigger this PR gets, the harder it is to review, mm -hmm. and the more the temptation to saying, you know what, let's just merge this in one go up and. We've had a few of those really big ones that we end up landing that way, and I mean it's part of life. You can't always control that, but but the the less that happens, the better off we are. I mean, the, yeah. the more things land in in digestible chunks rather than these monster things, the better off we are as a project. So so, so um, Zach, just to clarify, does your current multi-deer pull request use the contents 
web service at all? No. Okay. The, the uh, notes, right, right. No, 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 it doesn't. Okay. So let's pull the contents web service out of this pull, pull request. And once this is merged, let's create a separate pull request just for the contents web service, yeah. Yeah. independent of the UI. I, it, it will make it easier just to, to get this one reviewed and sort of in a smaller piece. And uh, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, Paul, does that kind of address the, what you what you had in mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will, and and so then I'll just the changes that I was going to propose there. I'll I'll put them in the new PR as well. Okay, cool, perfect. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, should I should I? So how does that do? I do I set, do I wait on posting the like? Do I post two PRs? One that is yeah. on top yeah. of that right now. Yeah, yeah. I'll help you out, Zach. Okay, thanks. Yeah. We can Skype later on today. Skype date. <laughs> yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, Matthew Russell's book. That was oh. Zach. Oh yeah, I just posted it because uh, he had posted something in HipChat and asked if we wanted to review it. But I think Paul said he would, and I don't know if anybody else was interested in it. And I, uh, I haven't heard back from 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 Matt. Okay. You mean um, to review the book, like to do a book review? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I just because oh, yeah, okay. it's, you know, it's uh, He's, it's pretty cool. So he's been, yeah, he's no, been no. pretty active in, in, in coming into HipChat late at night when I'm oh, me, me or Min are the only ones there and sort of asking questions and then getting <laughs> um, getting feedback and or finding bugs and things like that. So sort of leading up to 1.0, he was pretty excited and uh, and so he sure. has his his GitHub repo is basically for that book is just a bunch of IPython notebooks pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is fantastic. It it, it finally happened. Uh, I remember we had a conversation. I don't think it was with him. It was with another set of O'Reilly authors back at PyCon 2011 about this, or maybe it was with him. I can't remember anymore. And uh, I don't think so. What's that, Brian? Do you remember? Uh, who was his name? Maxime. It was Maxime, but but I thought Maxime was working with someone, or was Maxime's book a different book? It was a different. It's a different book. It's a different book. Okay. Yeah, it is. It but is. it's kind of similar similar topic, sort of social Absolutely. network analysis, yep. right? Yep. And also and also O'Reilly. Um, so anyway, it happened with a different O'Reilly book, but no, this is great. Is this book, is this second edition already physically available in print, or is it no? No, no he's okay. he's updating it right now. Okay, got it, got it. Got and then there's also uh, Olivier's book. That he's working on that I, I I'm yes. pretty sure is going to have notebooks associated with it. Yeah, uh, certainly. Yeah, he said he had he had a, a deadline about that earlier this week. So yeah, uh, and that's also O'Reilly. I think that's right. Okay, good, good. It's, it's is it is it a machine stuff. learning book? Yeah, 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 yeah machine okay. learning stuff. Um, yeah, he said he had a deadline this week. So. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I'm going to sign up to be a reviewer. Uh, I, I just know I would drop the ball on that. I'm, I'm dropping enough balls as it is. But if, if anyone else on the team wants to do it, that's fantastic. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it would be great if, if there was a, a technical review from at least one of us. That would be very yeah. good. Yeah, so on it. Great. OK, anything else on that? All right, Thomas, you have the floor. Right, so uh, we've supported Python 3 for a couple of releases now. Um, but it's been using 2 to 3 at setup time, so when you install it on Python 3, it takes a couple of minutes to run 2 to 3 over the code base before it finishes installing it. Um, now, the way that everybody seems to be going is just having a single code base um, which supports recent versions of Python 2 and Python 3, um, and we've Drop support now for Python 2.6 so and Python 3.2. Just to clarify, Thomas, in the notes, supporting Python 2, it's really Python 2.7, right? Yeah, yeah. We're and only Python now aiming to support 2.7, 3.3, and above. And 3.3, or yeah, 2.7 and 3.3 plus. And actually, I, I've not followed this discussion very closely. What specific language features in 3.3 are making this possible? Um, the main difference from 3.2 is that the U prefix for Unicode strings uh, has made a reappearance. It doesn't now have any effect, but you can put it in there and it's still syntactically valid code. 
So that means we just we don't have to wrap all of our Unicode strings in a little helper function, which and, we would have had to do if we were supporting 3.2. And then is uh, is a, a plain string with no U still Unicode though? In Python 3, yes. Great. Okay. So basically, we want to start to use the U prefix everywhere for Unicode strings. Well, we already are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they made it. It was a concession that the, Py the core Python team basically made to backwards compatibility. And as simple of a concession as it was, it had a huge impact because it allowed people to have unified code bases with yeah. Unicode strings without a helper functions everywhere that yeah, are yeah. ugly and expensive. And so it's, it, the one it really ma it, it's made a big difference. Yeah, it's the one part of the language that we've struggled with that's not just already a function that we can wrap and so on. Yeah, and, and since it was on, up to 3.2, if you put that U in there, it was just invalid syntax. You, could, you just couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Progress. So, so one thing we we've been talking here with uh, with uh, Thomas and Paul about this, uh, and this is important for for Zach and and Brian to to hear about is that obviously a PR like this PR is an extraordinarily disruptive PR, right? Uh, because it touches all of the code, it goes everywhere, uh, and it's going to induce a it will induce conflicts with basically anything that's in flight. B, um, it keeps having conflicts whenever anything is merged, more or less, right? So this is one of those PRs. So Thomas has it basically working already, but every time anything gets merged, it, it goes it goes stale, and he has to work on it again. So since now he has sort of proved that it works, I suggested to him that he sort of hold off on it for a few weeks and kind of just let it go stale, um, and then we will do the big stuff like Zach's um, big work merge it and then at that point we were going we're going we're going to have to do as a team one of those concerted efforts to basically flush everything we can and then give Thomas a day or two to work on this okay. pausing pausing the other stuff and we'll need to help Thomas basically to flush flush everything else that can be done will get merged and then we'll we'll mark whatever we decide can't get merged quickly will not they will get tagged Thomas has the kind of has a lock effectively on the whole thing to rebase his PR. He'll have a million cleanups and conflicts to fix up. Then that will go in, and that will instantly conflict everything that didn't get merged. Onto. Basically, when that goes in, whatever whatever we couldn't flush will uh, will instantly go into conflict mode. Um, okay. And then we'll have to help out. So, so I think the, the time ordering process should be we try to do and it's, it looks like the, the, the Zach's work is not going to be a PR, but more like maybe three, it sounds like, my understanding. Maybe something like two to three, like the main one, the content, um, <laughs> and, three, uh, and maybe the UI. So what's that? <laughs> word choice on two to three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, so I think we should basically do our best to help Zach um, landing that as smoothly as we can now, because obviously that kind of doing, I mean, Doing both of these at the same time is impossible. So let's land Zach's. Once Zach's work is clear, we do our best to flush everything we can, and then we do the two to three one, and then we we can go back into sort of regular small small PR development mode. Does, okay. that, does that seem sensible to everyone? Does anybody yeah. have any any objections or any thoughts? Well, I I think one thing that would be helpful, Thomas, is if you could write on the GitHub wiki under the development pages, sort of a, a summary of considerations that all of us should have in mind when we're writing yes. new code with this new approach in mind so that we basically get into the habit of, of having a, a place where we can look when we have questions about, OK, how, how do I need to handle this particular type of thing? Um, both the Unicode and the, the string issues, but also if there's other other sort of compatibility things we have to be aware of that that we have a, a location on the GitHub wiki to, to refer to rather than always having to ask you. <laughs> yeah, Thomas, you have to keep in mind in the entire team, unless Jess, uh, unless Jess is a Python 3 person, uh, but as far as I know, all of us are are day-to-day -day Python 2. So we are, we are very likely... On the time uh, being. <laughs> for the time being. No, I'm actually looking, I'm really looking forward to this, actually, because yeah. once this is true, I might actually start, and now that 
NumPy and Matplotlib and everything else is available, I might actually start using Python 3 as my daily tool. Um, so, yeah. but, but, but we're, we're, we're coming from behind is what Brian is saying. We're, we're, yeah. we're, these are not our, our automatic habits and replaces. So if you give us a little reminder guide, it'll be, it'll be very, very useful. Yeah, I'll do that. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Um, anything else on that? OK, uh, Paul, do you want to talk about the what's new stuff? Oh, this is just uh, well, just a, uh, just to put it on people's radars, and uh, yeah, I yeah, sent yeah. a well, note to the mailing list about this. <laughs> right, yeah, so uh, pull request 470 documents a new way of documenting changes of to our what's new section. And so if you all could take a look at that and uh, give feedback on that, the idea being that uh, along with sort of the two to three um, drop in two to three, uh, we keep getting, um, for, for the PRs that do a good job of documenting what they're actually changing or what in incompatibilities they're introducing, um, we are uh, getting conflicts for those PRs whenever we merge one of them, all the rest, because they edit the same sections in, the, in our singular what's new document in uh, development.rsd. Um, and so what this proposal does is to create a little creates a little directory where anyone can make a new text file that documents those changes and then periodically we'll grab the text files in that directory and just concatenate them all into that what's new document. We really want to encourage people to kind of update what's new as they work but it's a natural spot for pretty much guaranteed conflicts all the time if we do that. In fact, yeah. when we went to distributed version control, that's why we had to stop using a changelog file because it was it was impossible to maintain a, a changelog file with distributed version control. So it looks like honestly the the approach of of a little directory with a, with with kind of named files for the what's new elements is the simplest solution. And then it's completely trivial to write that little script that merges them and periodically, once every few weeks, just puts that into the main file and deletes the file. The whole process can be completely automated. Uh, and it'll it'll encourage us to keep the what's new updated so that at release time, nobody has to trawl six months worth of, of, of Git logs to, to build um, to build the, the release notes. But that the what's new document is basically nearly ready. So I, we talked a fair bit about it. I can't think of any objection to, to, the, to the plan, unless anybody has. And, and if you, obviously, if you see small details with the implementation, by all means, um, pitch in on the, in the review of the PR. So what, one thing, as we start to do this more as we work, I think for what's new to be useful, we want to try to strike a balance between adding things to what's new when we should, but also, like, I don't think every pull request should have an entry on what's new. It, otherwise, oh, no. people yeah. will never read it. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. No, no, what's, what's new should be the, the chunky stuff. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the, 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 the it's not a change log. I mean, the git log, it's not a, a copy of the git log. Let's yeah, it, that. It, and, and, like, I would say a good fraction of bug fixes yeah. that don't introduce Incompatible changes, like never mention. Yeah, no. yeah. It's only really new features and incompatible changes in the API. Great. Yeah, but the incompatible ones, those really should be documented right away because that's exactly the kind of thing you know. You know, you're doing it when you do it. You forget about it later, and then yeah. it's very easy for that to slip unnoticed at release time. So any incompatible changes to the API, even small ones, should go in right away. So. A question about NB convert. Mm -hmm. I mean, every change we make to NB convert right now is incompatible. Yeah, no, the, the, that, that's that's okay. I don't think we need to document. I mean, NB yeah. convert was released as alpha, and we know okay. we sort of sort of told people that we would break things, and just so long as we the, were very the, the right way of doing. And we convert as documented. That's fine. We were very explicit because I think for that, what's going to happen is instead instead of like every last little in backward incompatible thing, we'll probably, in 2.0, we'll have to have a summary section of, like, the NB convert API is now the following, right? And, and, and now it is more stable and so on and so forth. <laughs> but rather than documenting every last thing that we had said was going to break, and it's like, oh, yes, we, we said what we did. We, we, we did what we said we would do. We broke it. Uh, I, I don't think we need to worry about that. And, and the, other, the other thing is to, to sort of address Brian's concern is that 
we it's much it'll be much easier to remove things from that document that are sort of too explicit or the Ab too detail oriented than yeah. than having to figure out what to add to it later. Absolutely, that, that's for sure. Okay, um, so. I don't know if uh, let's leave the, this thing that Min wanted to talk about to the very end because it, it's it's mostly just to get on a conversation that that Min wanted. But let's let's go on with other things where we have everyone in the room. Yeah. So Br Brian, um, some NB convert things. Yeah. So I've been spending some time on NB convert. I have a pull request open for the citation implementation. Um, I've written some simple documentation and have uh, example notebooks in the NB convert examples repo. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you know, if, if people can have a look, um, it's it's pretty simple code and functionality. Um, I also uh, re uh, did some refactoring of the PDF post processor, so it will actually run BibTeX for you. Um, oh, cool. And it also now cleans up the uh, LaTeX temporary files um, when it creates the PDF. So um, just uh, there's that one. And then I'm starting to work on and, and work with Jonathan on refactoring the, the LaTeX templates. Um, basically, my, my vision is that we build a very plain, generic template that does not use Sphinx um, and which has extremely simple prompts. And, and, and my, my thought is, I think our base template needs to be something that someone could easily adapt to write uh, a, a journal article with, where they're not going to mm -hmm. want a lot of the crazy extra code that we're using for syntax highlighting, and they're not going to want all the Sphinx templated stuff mm -hmm. uh, or the Sphinx style classes. Start with a nice base and basically come up with Jinja blocks that allow the customization of that template very easily and then build the Sphinx version on top of that and also make it really easy for people to swap out the style that the uh, code cells are formatted in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I have another pull request open that adds sort of a, a simple Python prompt style code mm -hmm. cell look. Um, and yeah, ba basically make it more modular. And part of my motivation is that the Sphinx transformer has slowly been growing config equals true attributes, and that was exactly the thing that we wanted to avoid with the templates in the first place. Um, but the templates are not really set up well for customization. So I want to basically make that possible and, and then strip out all those config equals true attributes as much as possible. Um, from the transformers. I'm just taking notes. Uh, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm completely on board with that. I'm just recording Great. some of that in Hackpad. I, I, I think that's that's exactly the, the direction we we would we should be going into. Uh, and uh, it seems like the the language that that we want to expose, or kind of the, the work model that we want to expose, is is more based on templates than based on munging with code objects, uh, unless yeah. you're really writing very advanced functionality. Uh, and so, if if that's the model we want to present, then we should we should have those building blocks be easy to to recompose and and reuse in in different ways uh, without having to go without having to go back to the to the Python code all the time. So yeah, I, I, it sounds this sounds like a great idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of view our our success metric in this is when people stop submitting pull requests when they want to change things about their document. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's great. And on Hackpad, uh, Jake Vanderplas is like, yes, this is fantastic. <laughs> okay. On the other hand, there are some things that should be that should be config. You yes. know, like paper size. Well, I, I'm. I. We'll see. I, I'm, I want. <laughs> I mean, the, the, this, this, it's a really, really slippery slope, and 
I think I want to encourage people to think of the template as their document. And they should change the document just like they would change any other document. So, for example, the author, the date, the title, the uh, all of that stuff, I, I think. And actually, here here's a design question. Should our Jinja blocks be entire fragments in that markup language or just particular values that get inserted there? For example, one way of handling the LaTeX document class and paper size would be to have a block that has that single line where you specify the class and the paper size and all that. The other option is to have individual Jinja blocks for each of the values in that overall statement that we inject there. I think my preference is to have people write entire fragments. So force, you know, give them the power to override that single LaTeX line rather than us trying to guess all possible parameters they might want to insert there. I think we can um, start, I, I would start with the, the kind of give them all the power. Uh, we can always, as far, if I understand Jinja correctly, though I haven't used it too much, um, our own block template could itself use fragments. Oh yeah, absolutely, it's values. nested. So, yeah. so they're completely nestable. So I would start with these things because that is a little bit more verbose, but it is it gives full power. Right. If you if you have to write the full fragment, there's a little bit of redundancy because maybe you're always putting the same document class and whatnot, even though you're just changing paper size or whatever. But it, it gets the job done. I mean, the, the only cost is a little. You have to write a little bit more verbosity rather than simply setting a paper size flag. And if if as we learn from usage, if people start saying, look, this is getting too annoying, or we ourselves find it's getting annoying, we want this, these are really the two flags that 99% of the cases need, well, we make those available as flags, and we, we refactor our own block into a block that has nested values for a few things, so yep. most people can, but, but those are the kinds of decisions that are best engineered based on data rather than guessing up front, so we, up front, we do the simple clunky block, big block thing. Coarse uh, grain. Yeah, the coarse grain. The, we, we, we take the coarse grain approach, which we know solves all the problems, even if it's potentially a little bit verbose and redundant. And then we gather our own. We're pretty picky about that, and we're very picky. If, if an API feels annoying to use, we will ourselves know that it's bothering us, and we will make it more fine-grained. But that way, we don't make everything fine-grained from day one. OK. That, that seems to me like a good, a go, a good way of balancing. OK. Yeah, I'll, I'll but I, I really like this direction in which things are going, by the way. Uh, Jake is not the only one who's happy. This is fantastic news. Yeah, I, I want to write a physical review article using the notebook, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, OK, um, anything else on, on, on this, Brian? Um, I guess the only other NB convert thing is the vertical space formatting issue and the, the notebook style. Jonathan, you want to, or Paul, you want to give us a quick update on that? Oh yeah, I, I don't know what that is about. So please. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a problem, and Paul looked at it. Both both Paul and I looked at it, and it has to do with the MD frame package that we use to draw the smooth cornered boxes in the LaTeX templates, um, where things are not vertically aligned on some people's LaTeX, and they are aligned on other people's LaTeX, and it's not just as simple as an extra blank line here or there. It seems like Ouch. everybody, yeah. And and it's kind of hard to track down because there's all the different package versions. And I don't really, I don't really understand where exactly the problem is coming what, from. What 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 what? Um, sorry, what logic package is the one that's kind of in the middle of this complicated thing? Um, MD what? M MD framed. So that draws the colored frames with the padding and the multiple page support. And then it also has padding support for multiple pages. So you can have different paddings where the page breaks. Uh, so it's a really complicated package. And is there is there a GitHub? Support. Sorry, is, sorry, Zach, that I'm interrupting you, but I'm trying to annotate this well. Is there a GitHub issue around this specific problem already? Yes. Uh, yes can yes. you give me, me the number? See. Yeah, let me see if I can pull it up. 
I'm just, it, it sounds nasty, and so I just want to understand and document. It well, is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, uh, it sounds, it sounds it ugly. Is very ugly. So it is number 3866. Okay. 3866. Oh, I see. Yeah. And this, this, this bug Gosh. actually was part of what motivated my wanting a really simple Python prompt style. Uh -huh. that we don't need it, these packages for because it... I mean, I, I think we absolutely want to fix this and get this working because it looks fantastic. Well, if we can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, well, the reason, why I say, well, the reason why I say that is because it sounds like it, it could be the kind of thing where different versions of this MD frame package do different things with different Latic implementations and it yeah. might be one of those yeah. things where we, mm -hmm. we can never quite can it nail it down to something that works? Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Wow, that is that is ugly. So is it, isn't that really bad? Do you see how, how all three of us have different spacing, and it's not even no, the it's same horrible. problem? Yeah. yeah. So one, so the, the, these were all these were all screenshots that you guys took. Like off a rendered PDF, right? You yes. rendered it and then you took yes. a screenshot. You took a screenshot of the PDF out of Jeez. Yeah, but if you look ah, at forty forty one, I mean, so there's a there, that that has to do with a particular implementation that we had before. Uh, I mean, this is how we realized it was a big issue, uh -huh. and and both in in the PR that um, forty forty one and the PR that I have, it gets better, right? So so it's not it's not gonna stay this bad. Okay. Um, okay. And so I think I mean we know what some of the issues are. So yeah, it'll, it'll, it's much better actually. Yeah, it's, it's much better. It's, it's sort of more consistent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Consistently wrong. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So actually, one one thing that I realized when I was doing the Python prompt version is, for that version, all I do is I prefix the Python prompts to the actual code uh, area and then I just pass the whole block with the prompts to pigments. And so there's no fancy MD frames, it's just text. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that makes it possible to do is that there's no output prompts in that style. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I don't have to worry about having a prompt next to output of arbitrary type. It's this combination, I mean the thing is that with our prompts, it's actually a 2D grid that has inputs, input prompts, input block, output prompt, and output block. So it's a two-dimensional alignment problem. Whereas, well, but the thing, the thing, the input is trivial because the input's always text. The output mm -hmm. is where it's a problem because it's it can be an image, it can be LaTeX, it can be anything. Anything, yeah. And and the aligning MD framed in a grid is uh, it's, fun. it's not I easy. Yeah, yeah I but, imagine. But one. One solution is to inject a, a Python prompt as text on the input and just use no output prompt. That style is trivial to implement. We'd want to add support for IPython style input prompts to the pigments lexer, but that's trivial. Uh -huh. and, and that would have no, I mean, it, it would work. And then are you talking about just underlaying the MD frames as colored boxes around uh, no, the code, I think in, No, I think in that style, I would just leave the MD frames oh, all oh, oh, okay. I mean, just dead simple. So uh, one question, um, Zach and, um, I'm sorry, Jonathan and, and Paul. Have you guys asked on the LaTeX uh, exchange, on the Stack Exchange LaTeX, no. about this? I, I would I would pitch in there with a question and maybe linking to these things. The people who the people who hang out at, at the LaTeX Stack <laughs> Exchange are frighteningly knowledgeable <laughs> about LaTeX. I mean, these are the people who sort of dream in the funky syntax of BibTeX style files, right? Which looks like <laughs> phone line noise to you or, or me. 
um, and they, they find it beautiful and elegant and readable. Uh, and so I would, I, it wouldn't hurt to ask those people. They, they really know, I mean, they have forgotten more about logic that all of us will ever learn combined. Uh, and so it, it may be worth just asking them um, because they may point you, maybe they point you to a different package that is easier to use than MD Frame and, and it doesn't have these issues. Maybe they point you to a solution. I don't know. I would at least, I'd burn, I'd burn a half hour on, on, on hanging out on Stack Exchange and seeing what, what you get out of those people. It, it, it's worth a try. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. I'll do that today. But do you, do you think it makes sense to have a simpler prompt based mode? Or is that just not even? Yeah, may, I mean, maybe if, if this is going to be if this is going to be this ugly, um, it's it's kind of losing the output one is a little unfortunate because it means I mean having a, a, a simple mode that doesn't have the output prompts has the unfortunate problem that um, it it doesn't it, it kills a distinction which is an important distinction in Python between yeah. Re return values and, and output, um, return values and and, uh, and sort of side effect output, um, and also because our out is a data structure, out yeah. is a data structure, and these values are available. And if somebody has actually code that refers to it and with underscores or whatnot, then that stuff becomes like not kind of nonsensical when you read it, or a little bit harder to understand. So it, it's a suboptimal solution, but sometimes suboptimal solutions. Are okay, are an okay tool to have. If the optimal solution isn't working right or can't be made to work reliably, people may say, "Look, I'm, I'd rather I'd rather have something with, with without the output prompts that looks okay vertically, rather than this completely messed up vertical alignment." So, I mean, the other option is we can just display the out prompt and the output in a in vertical sequence, rather than trying to align them yeah. next to each other. And yeah, it's true. That, that, that's the that's the approach that uh, Matthew Brett considered doing. So, uh, can can we go back for a second to the stuff that Brian was talking about? Because we have a plain REST template, and I think we have a uh, simpler lot like a lot of basic templates. How 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 are those related to the, the new things that you wanted to make and be plain, Brian? So so the the basic LaTeX template mm -hmm. is separate from the Sphinx template currently. Mm -hmm. And I would like to unify them all under a common inheritance tree that makes basically makes it all more organized and logical. Would the Sphinx ones be uh, inheriting from our base basic one as well, or something like that? Uh, I, w I would have a, a base LaTeX template, then I would probably have a LaTeX article template, um, and have Sphinx article inherit from that. OK, got it. Okay. So, or something like that. I, I haven't really thought about the details. So you're thinking of unifying on top of that and kind of rationalizing th that existing stuff? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. OK. okay. And, and we, when, when Jonathan started to do the Sphinx stuff, we had this older LaTeX base template. And he, I mean, I don't know if you even touched that at all, Jonathan. But it, it yeah, I did. Effort. I did. Okay. I did. There, there was stuff in there that I, I just couldn't make work. But instead of changing the base, I just kind of went my own way. <laughs> no, it's fine. It, we just need to clean it up. It, it's so. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Paul? Yeah, it does. And so the question then, the follow-up question is, would we do a similar thing for our rest stuff? Because right now we have a plain rest one, and then we have. Uh, don't we have more sophisticated one? I just don't know where it lives. Like a Sphinx one? I have not. Okay. No, I don't think so. I, I okay. think we just have the rest. OK. Um. I think we were talking with Matthew Brett about working on a Sphinx one, but I don't think it exists yet. Yeah. yeah. The, the Sphinx.tplx template that's there in the LaTeX directory, Paul, is actually LaTeX Sphinx. Right, right, OK. Yeah. But, but this, I guess this issue of, um, of prompt numbering and things like that came up when Matthew tried to integrate our um, and oh, yeah. convert to RSD output yeah. Absolutely. into a Sphinx. Um, 
proper Sphinx build. Yeah, that, I can that see would... myself over there. <laughs> oh, hi, Paul. Hello. I... <laughs> Say something, okay, Tom. So, so this is this is going to take um, this is going to take a little bit more work. It sounds like this is this is a little ugly. Um, yeah. Although I would uh, the yeah. I'm hoping that we can mer even though it's going to end up being refactored. The Python prompt style pull request that I have, I think we should mm -hmm. just go ahead and merge that now. Okay. I don't basically. I mean, I had talked. Uh, can, can you can you give us the number of the PR so I can put it here in the hack? Yeah, pack? I, I had talked with Min about starting to do some of the refactoring in that pull request, but it's just going to it's going to expand the scope too far on that. So I think we should just you know review it as is. Mm -hmm. Um, knowing that a lot of it's going to change. Um, Remember the number? Uh, 4034. 34, okay. Oh. Whoa. Okay, I added something along along that. Uh, let me know if you if you think that captures what you have in mind in the notes, uh, in the in the hack pad. Um. Yeah. 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 It's it's it seems like, and 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 maybe maybe having having these slightly less visually perfect, uh, maybe vertically offset in out uh, prompt handling. Uh, may end up being the, the solution for the for the simple one uh, with with an MD frame. It may also be that the MD frame one requires if we, if we end up understanding what the vertical alignment is, but it's something that is a little bit implementation dependent. It may be the kind of thing where we ha say in order to use this, you'll have to fidget with adding a block with some options to it, and then but each person has to do it by doing it and looking at what comes out on their computer. Um, yeah. if, if it's not something that we can understand in a generic way. I mean, that's. I suspect somebody in LaTeX is going to find out how to fix that and tell us because that 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 what I just said is kind of anathema to LaTeX purists' ears. The notion that people should have to fidget visually with with their own version of the document to get a PDF that looks a certain way that on somebody else's LaTeX comes out different. But hey, that's what you guys are seeing. <laughs> so yeah. so either either we're doing something wrong or or that's going to have to be the the, the answer. And so be it. Yeah, Brian, you wanted to tackle documentation more in depth. Um, I mean, I, I unless 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 there's anything else on this MD convert stuff, but it sounded like we have kind of covered it. I think that's good. Um, one of the the tasks that that I have for 2.0 is to start to think about the documentation. Yeah, basically, how do we approach documentation with notebooks? And I I haven't made a lot of progress. But I've been thinking a little, a little bit about how. I mean, there, I guess there's two questions that I wanted to discuss at this point. One is one, one a project, IPython or someone else, wants to offer notebook-based documentation. Do they do they put those notebooks in their actual Python package? Or do they put it in a separate GitHub repo? And it and my my goal is to to enable people to view the documentation statically online using NB convert. I'm sorry, NB viewer, but also in the notebook web application that we can query the package to find the notebook-based documentation and allow a user to browse it and open those notebooks from within the web application. Mm -hmm. And I, I can imagine advantages to both having it sort of in the package but also as a separate GitHub repo. Because if it's a separate GitHub repo, a project could have multiple repos. One is a tutorial. One is their sort of standard narrative documentation. It there, There's a little 
a little more flexibility. And so I, I don't know. I, I mean, what do you guys think? So what about what about this idea of um, being able to dynamically put in links into our help documentation that we discussed? I don't remember which PR it was on, but being able to sort of register, having a JavaScript API to register links to the help um, for different packages. I I think we'll. Because, because I can imagine, I, I, the reason I sort of bring that up is because I can imagine uh, different projects wanting to do either one or the other of what, what's proposed. Either, uh, you know, the notebooks live along with the package so that when you when you pip install them that you have notebooks available. Or that the notebooks get updated so often that they live in their own repo that's always on the web. And, you know, the standard way of getting uh, docs is by going to whatever, python.org or something like that. I mean, I, I think... I think part of what we're going to end up doing is indexing Python packages and querying them in some appropriate way to find their documentation and mm -hmm. dynamically building the help view based on that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what that's quite going to look like, but I, I'm not quite at the point of, of, of thinking about what I don't know. I mean, it, it might be the type of thing that when we when a package is imported, mm -hmm. they can publish a JavaScript object that registers their help in the menu. It could be something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah right. Um, I, 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 yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite there in thinking about what that would look like. I'm more. I more want to think about the model of like where do people put their documentation. So I've, uh, I completely, first of all, I completely agree with you that we are going to end up with indexing machinery for this. We've talked about this. I think the first discussions of this, Robert Kern and I had them probably in 2005. Yeah, uh, this, is, yeah this is something we've been talking about for years and years, that it, it is the only sensible solution in the end. Part of the reason why we never made progress on it was because there really wasn't a tool to present that documentation in any particularly useful way and whatnot. And so nobody really made much headway into the problem. Now that we have the notebook machinery, I think it's this is where it becomes sensible to really think about it. Yeah. Um, I, I would say I would solve these uh, in, in a staggered way. I'm, I lean strongly towards the notion of keeping the docs at least at the main, the starting point. Obviously, Nothing prevents someone from having extra repos and collections of examples and notebooks and whatever. And effectively, these books that are coming out or these tutorial collections that people are writing are that. Right? Yeah. And nobody, nobody, nothing prevents somebody from, from, from doing that. But what I think the starting point um, for, for sort of notebook collections that tend to be associated with a software library or a software yeah. project, say scikit, scikit learn, scikit image, numpy, scipy, simpy. Right. Um, the ones that tend to live with a software project, I think there's a good argument to be made for them to live in the repo, the main one being the coupling between the versions of the API of that project and the, ver and the code in those notebooks, in that if you start decoupling those, then it becomes much harder for the project and for the users to know which version of these docs, of the repo of the docs, is meant to execute with which version of the actual source that they live with, because yeah. I think it's much it's much easier to tell a project if you change your API and SymPy integrate now takes a different keyword argument. Well, go and change your integrate example right in your docs, and when you and if you have a virtual env with SymPy 1.0 that had the old API and another virtual env with SymPy 2.0 with the new API, when you view the docs, there is no there, there's nothing to worry about. You will get assuming that the project updated their examples, you always get the consi consistent one. That, if we break that linkage, ensuring that consistency becomes a nightmare. And it becomes a nightmare, especially you have to think that in the Python world, we are crippled by not having any sensible APIs and, and built into the, the, the package management machinery of the language is so bad that there is no sensible way of managing versions and declaring version versions in, in, in any civilized manner, right? So the only way that we can do is by just having them linked, right? Having them completely linked internally, and the docs go with the package, whatever version that happens to be, they're, they're together, right? So what I think what we can do is come up with um, layout conventions, and eventually those layout conventions should be enshrined, once we understand better what works well, we enshrine it into a little API, and whether it's something like having 
a top le a package level, double underscore, uh, notebook uh, locations or something, and wh and whether that's a string, that probably was going to be a dict with a few fields because we're probably going to need more than one piece of information from it, and maybe it's going to be the path, and maybe it's going to be a version, and maybe it's going to be a, there's going to be format information. I don't know. I mean, we'll have to think, but basically something that can be encoded in JSON so that we can have other project non Python projects absorb the same. Um, approach. So you imagine Julia, ju an API that could be also given to Julia so that the UI components can understand the, basically the same information for Julia packages. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I, 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 would, I would go with that, living in the repo, but then we explore are they, um, do they live kind of in a dock part of the repo that is installed in user share docs whatever, or do they live in the code part of the repo? Um, those are, and then once we understand which of those two alternatives is better, how do we register that information so that we can query it? Once well, we're happy with individual querying, we can agglomerate an index, but that, that well, should come later. And, and there's an uh, there's an additional point of complication, uh -huh. and that's that uh, the kernel is the part of the architecture that would be able to query the package about this information. Yeah. But the kernel is not the one that needs these files. It's the notebook mm -hmm. server that needs mm -hmm. these files. Yes. And so the, there may have to be an indexing step where we go query the packages, find the notebooks, and copy them to somewhere that the notebook server has access to. Mm -hmm. Like that, that may yeah. be required. Like yeah, maybe, you know, maybe we throw all those notebooks into .ipython documentation and serve it in the dashboard in an appropriate way. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a that's good. That's going to take some thinking. Um, yeah. Okay, but your but your thought is keep it together. Yeah, on that one I on that one I feel pretty strongly because I think that if we decouple that one at least for for software projects, we open a can of worms that is kind of unmanageable and we we don't have tools to manage it. So I on that one, I feel pretty strongly that, that they should live together. Now, eventually, I think we will want um, a generic registration API for document collections so that they can go into this index. Because imagine you also have a couple of books installed, and you have you have the notebook repo for this Mining the Social Web book. Well, it turns out that that book has Twitter API examples, and it has Network X examples. You would like, when you search your help browser, about how to do graph analysis in Network X, those examples to show up in your search results because yeah. hey, that's it's a it's a book that I have installed that has this information and I want it to show up, right? Um, yep. So it should be possible for sort of non non library packages to register documentation as well. But I would say let's solve that problem on a second stage. We keep it in the horizon so that it's kind of a design constraint that, that we're aware of. But we start with what we know, which are libraries, SymPy, scikit-learn, scikit-image, numpy, scipy, pandas, that have their own documentation that is becoming more and more notebooky. Yeah. Okay. I, I I think that's a good idea. And then the second thing is the on the question of API documentation and how to integrate it. And I've been looking a little bit more at how Mathematica does this, and they, mm -hmm. their, their, their distinction between API documentation and narrative documentation is, I mean, it's very subtle. Like, it's not like, you know, you, when you look at their documentation, you make some initial choice to look at narrative documentation or API documentation. They're very interwoven. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to figure out, well, how could we do that? And my best thought is to write a set of Python functions and classes that can be passed Python functions and classes as strings, which will query those objects, extract the doc strings, and build an HTML representation which gets sent into the notebook at that location. And so I'm writing a narrative documentation and I want to inject the API documentation for a particular Python class 
I just, I mean, there's going to be a line of Python code. Now we can hide that and then be convert using mm -hmm. metadata, but the HTML documentation gets injected in an output cell, and we can even include hyperlinks to different things that way. Right, I mean, it, it, it yeah, all something. Works. It's something like a hybrid between the question mark and percent load kind of thing, where uh, that yeah. basically you, you you put some bit of code and the output. I mean, question mark dumps that doc string into the page as plain text, exactly. but it would be a, a version of that that formats it and instead of dumping it into the pager, puts it as an output block that is nicely formatted right there. Um, and it wouldn't be called question mark; it would be something else. And and yeah. yeah. And so that that's my current thinking sort of, and it, it sort of, it's a very different model than sort of trying to dump the entire API documentation all at once for a project. This yeah. one says, you just pick and choose what you want to include in the API docs, and you put it wherever you want to put it. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it's sort of going in the direction that we've said, um, even for the API docs, that we would stop doing running an auto-generate script that simply yes. um, trawls the tree systematically, just trawls the entire tree and dumps everything it finds, modulo a few blacklist exceptions, which is what we have, and saying we should go more to using the, the Sphinx uh, class directives, class documentation directives, but with manually constructed indices so that we choose yeah. what we want to document. This is basically, it's, it's like a Sphinx uh, doc directive. Um, but done inside of the notebook. Um, yeah. And if we were to do that, those index pages, I mean, the simplest version is you just put, like, directive, 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 and nothing else. But obviously, nothing prevents you from uh, adding text, explanatory text, and saying, right. like, putting a little bit of, of, of a sort of a narrative material, putting that function in context, and then dumping its, basically, its richly formatted doc string right there, and then having some more context below. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think we were already moving in that direction uh, with with that discussion, and and, and so uh, that that's that's perfectly perfectly reasonable uh, because yeah, I, I think it's it's basically what we had already in a sense. It's what we had already said we we would do, but but going 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 sort of all the way with that rather yeah. than simply saying let's stop doing the auto scanning and manually construct bare indices, saying well those indices might as well be files that also have some editing. And we just use the auto class directives or the equivalent of an auto class directive in a notebook context. We use them along with a contextual narrative. Yeah. No, that, 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 sounds, that sounds like a, like a perfectly sensible approach. Great. One, does, any, does, does anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, somebody was speaking. Yeah, yeah, just one thread that I don't want to lose, that, that it's, it's a shame that, that we released 1.0, that there, when you get 1.0 right now, there's no, our example notebooks, the only way to get them is to clone our GitHub repo or, or to grab a, a tarball. When you pip install IPython, you do not get our notebooks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and so that's we, should, another... we should think about moving them in, in a, or, or, or registering them with the, whatever the extra so that they are included. Yeah, that's another, that's another uh, reason for keeping them. I mean, uh, they're already in our repo, right? But it's, it adds yeah. another, uh, another point of, for, for the, the notion of keeping them in the same repo. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, in addition to that, obviously that's not enough because we already have them in the same repo and they're not getting, they're not being made available. But obviously, if we were to pull them out of the repo, it would be even worse. Yeah. yeah no. I. So I mean, yeah. I, I mean, so I. I think I'm going to spend some time thinking about this stuff and try to. This, by the way, this is this is um, as you start. This is big and complicated. Oh, yeah. um, and so, as as you begin thinking about it, uh, start drafting an IPEP on this. Oh yeah, no, um, absolutely. This, this yeah. is I'm totally good. IPEP material, and in fact, this is one that is actually probably going to be one of our biggest efforts because this goes beyond, way beyond IPython. Oh yeah, every this is some, If if we're successful with this, uh, we should do it for ourselves first because nobody's going to mm -hmm. come and, and kind of uh, eat, <laughs> right. eat this dog food until we do it. So, but we need to do this. The only way in which this is going to have really major impact is if we're successful in having all the projects adopted, um, yeah. so that well, users end up having a unified experience. Well, and, and you have to go one step further. All of the projects in all of the languages. 
Exactly, and I was going to say that that's the first, and then the second is the the other languages as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. So so this is this is such an ambitious. I think now is the time to do it. We I've been th I've been thinking about this for easily seven or eight years. Now is the time to do it, but but it's big big and deep enough that that we should do it with 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 a carefully thought out IPEP. Uh, and I think we this is the kind of thing where for 2.0 we should begin doing it just whatever works for us. Let's not get too ambitious and let's just try something out that works for us and once we're happy with it we begin advertising it to I mean I know people are going to keep an eye on it and some other projects I mean the stats models guys are using lots of notebooks and their examples but but we shouldn't advertise any of this as this is the way to go until we're happy with it um, but let's do it keep keeping in mind that we want this to go across all the Python projects and to work well for the Julia guys and maybe one day for the R people and whatnot if, if they get around to writing a server Absolutely. Cool. All right, um, Thomas, you had a brief. Uh, anything else on on the on this, Brian? That you wanted to. That's all. Okay. Um, uh, Thomas, you had a uh, one point one possible release in the next few weeks. Do you want to say anything about that? Yes. So, um, like, there was a fairly egregious bug in one point oh in that we added these. We're trying to encourage people. We're trying to encourage more projects that are using IPython to move away from the embed function, which has various problems to do with namespaces, and to mm -hmm. use instead this these new functions we've added, start IPython and start kernel. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we added them for 1.0, but unfortunately, we didn't really test them at all. Um, <laughs> so start kernel in 1.0 literally doesn't work at all. If you call it, it will throw an error. And <laughs> start IPython, um, it works, but if you pass the user namespace in, which is one of the key things that people want to do with it, it has no effect at all. Um, yes. So we've added these functions, and at the moment, essentially, nobody can use them. Um, so I'd like to get, we've, you know, we've got the fix in, we've backported it already, um, but I'd like to get a 1.1 release out reasonably soon so that we can start telling people to use these and of course you know any other fixes that we're picking up as well so min 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 is always the guy in our team who's who's very on top of worrying about sort of the the, the backport machinery for the for the point dot dot one release of anything uh, and and I know that I mean he he opened the one X branch immediately. He started tagging things for backport. So and we had always said that we would give it three to four weeks after one O was out, and then start thinking about it. So I think the answer is absolutely. The fact that these pretty particularly egregious ones are are there obviously raises the uh, the, the the need for it. Um, I would suggest we wait for Mint to get back. Um, he's uh, I can't remember when he returns. Euro SciPy is over this week, but I thought I think he was going to stay in Europe for a few more days. Um, and then as soon as I, I think as soon as Min is back, we can do a quick triage of what uh, uh, what else. If there's anything else that's needed, um, I haven't spotted any other thing. But if anything else is a critical backport bug, let's flag it so that when Min gets back, we don't have to wait for too long. Um, is there uh, is there anything else uh, that anyone has seen? I think we've backported the things that needed to go in, so I, I know okay. I put in a few things and yeah. Yeah, a few things have been backported already. Ba okay. Basically, so anything that's been a bug fix since since one zero, we've backported. Okay. No Perfect. new features, that, that. but yeah. I, I would say a, let's a script in tools that does it quite easily now. Okay. Let's let's give Main a chance to get back uh, and land from Euro SciPy and 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 as soon as he's back on his feet, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it. So this should be a, a couple weeks at most. Is that. Does that sound reasonable to people? Yeah. Yeah. OK. And uh, finally, the only other thing we have in the agenda is that Min wanted to talk to start thinking about whether whether to have a, an ipython.notebook as a top-level package for various utilities that don't quite fit in NB convert, don't quite fit in, uh, uh, in NB format. Uh, and I don't quite fit in the, uh, so HTML is the client. Um, kind of the, the, the web application. So I don't know. I think we, we may want to write yeah, some, some, some particular examples. One is um, code that can just execute a notebook as a script. Um, Min, Min wants to make notebooks work with the run magic, and, and that would use it. Another example is the, 
the code that allows notebooks to be importable. Um, and, uh, and also, oops, is someone. But Min also thought about would we want to move NB format and NB convert under a notebook package? I don't know. Yeah, it's a little flat is better than nested. Of, that that's my feeling too. Yeah, we've we have we have gone to so I, I've been thinking whether just to have some <laughs> NB utils. Um, uh, because the other option is to go, I don't know, uh, to make a, an NB package, um, and then under NB to shove, format, convert, etc. But then obviously that would mean it would kind of it would seem to make sense to move the HTML thing under there, um, and but that one is pretty deep already, and we had moved it up precisely so that we wouldn't be no, typing flat. seven seven level seven level deep things. Um, NB, NB utils for now. Is, is, I mean, I think if we do a new package, it should probably be notebook. Uh -huh. um, I mean, we could just do NB utils under utils or something. Or I, I don't know. There, there, there really isn't a good place to put these utilities right now. No, there isn't. There isn't. Um, so. I don't know. NB put them under NB convert in in as much as they have to do with doing things with notebooks, having an NB convert utils. No, I mean it, the the running a notebook could be implemented as a transformer, a notebook to notebook transformer. That that that's okay. The the import notebook notebook processor you want. logic is I don't know where to put that. Yeah, core in the sense that I mean the problem is it, if it goes into core, it begins picking up weird weird import across, weird imports across our own code base, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, we, I don't know. We, we could just tell Min that we don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, part part of this discussion was just to put it on people's minds, think yeah. about it for next week. I don't have a good idea. I, I honestly don't have a good idea. Part of it was to put it put it on everyone's. Brains um, and yeah. simmer on it, and maybe next week we'll have a better idea. I don't know. Uh, we we weren't trying to to have an answer for today, just just to start thinking about it. But I do I do have one thought about it, in that um, yeah. I think the reason for having a notebook and not putting into core is that eventually uh, Min Min has this dream of just splitting off IPython into a whole bunch of different packages, right? Yeah. So that, we sh so, that so that so that somebody that wants to grab a notebook and import it doesn't need to have IPython installed even. They just have a simple little Python. They pip install a IPython notebook um, as a little module, and now they can import IPYNB files, or they get an IPYNB importer and an IPYNB runner, maybe, and they don't need any other IPython machinery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is an argument for putting it to, for for giving it a package. Uh, if we, uh, I uh, I think that dream of means of, of of extreme modularity is a dream that I will, uh, for the foreseeable future, continue to resist. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, because it's a dream. It's a dream that sounds really really good in theory, um, and and uh, can easily create and practice more problems than it appears to solve. Mm -hmm. um, and, and given the Given the sorry state of Python packaging um, and and the complete absence of any semantic control over versioning uh, and and whatnot, uh, that's a bridge uh, I'm not willing to cross uh, yeah. to cross yet. Uh, I, I know that having a big a big somewhat monolithic package has its own ugliness, uh, but it's an ugliness that solves problems, um, and this right. is one of those. Practicality versus purity, where the purity argument of high modularity sounds really good in theory, but it brings with it a, a, a lot of practical problems. Um, so, but I mean, it, it is an argument for having that. I don't think it's a super strong argument because that hypothetical day is still far in the future, and we'll see. We'll see if that horizon keeps receding or not. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, anything else, folks? We, we we don't need to make these two hours. I think it's a good idea to basically keep them 
keep them as long as they need to be, but as short as they can be. <laughs> can Jess and Debian say hi? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to say you, you guys have been awful quiet. Both Jess and Debbie and Damian have been awful, awful quiet. <laughs> Uh, um, do you guys do you have anything in mind? Anything that you guys would want to bring up? Not currently. Um, just listening for this week. Okay. Um, Damian, okay. Uh, anything anything that that you have in mind? Uh, probably the next week I will release the live review. As, uh, <laughs> Excellent. Great. So angry. So may, all... may you can test it uh, later in, in the week. And nothing more. There's a lot of excitement about that. I know that people, uh, people are. I mean, we have the stopgap one, which with, with, without reveal as a dependency that that is okay, but it's not nearly as pretty as the live reveal one. So that it'll be great to have that in. Great. Yeah. All right. Any anything else, anyone? All right, folks. Well, let's wrap it up. Um, as I said, on next Thursday, I have a I have an all-day workshop that I have to attend, so I won't be here. So one of you guys can start the meeting. Uh, wh wh one of you who is on a campus connection. So whether Brian's on campus or Min or Paul or Thomas, somebody who's on a campus wired connection. The host the host should never be somebody who's working from home, uh, because we we've, we've had problems with that in the past, and so. Um, let's make sure that whoever uh, begins the begins the meeting is one of one of us who's uh, one of you guys who's on campus. Okay, great. All right, guys, I'm gonna end the broadcast. We're off the air. Thanks.